Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's my privilege as the headmaster of St Kevin's to welcome you here this evening, and uh, in particular, of course, to welcome the Honourable Christopher Pine. And it's a uh, it's a good thing when a school can uh, welcome any politician, I think, into its midst, and it's always important that we have that chance to listen and uh, discover that we uh, share the, just then, the female lines of our family are woven intimately through Loretta, be it uh, Marionville or here in Melbourne or here in Sydney. So that was, that was great to know. It's of course a real privilege to have Kelly O'Dwyer here as our local member and when Kelly asked whether St Kevin's might be able to assist, we jumped at the opportunity because of the strong support that we received from you Kelly and we're delighted to be able to be of assistance. And it's also a delight to have Michelle Green from the AISB as their Chief Executive and of course uh, Mr Ross Fox as the Director of Policy, Research and Communications from the Catholic Education Office in Melbourne. And finally here of course to welcome Senator Scott Ryan. Uh, whilst he didn't sit in this theatre as such, he's on home turf <laughs> as, a, as a respected uh, alumni of, of St Kevin's as well. So you are very welcome, and Kelly, I invite you to address us. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much for hosting us here at St Kevin's. St Kevin's, of course, is one of the great success stories of independent schooling. So many of your alumni are so very distinguished and famous, and Scott, I do include you in that. But of course, um, Tony Abbott, who is the, the, the leader of the party that I represent, uh, is a great admirer of one of your alumni who, who went to St Kevin's, BA Santa Maria. So you have a very distinguished group of people. But today we're here to learn just a little bit more about the Gonski Review and the impact it is going to have on your schools, whether it be on funding, on your ability to set fees. There are a whole range of issues associated with the Gonski Review that leave so many questions unanswered. And here in Higgins, this is a particularly important issue for us because we have 44 schools in the electorate, 19 of which, if the government does not guarantee indexation, will lose $26 million by 2017. Now, that money is going to have a very direct impact on the sorts of services that can be offered, the sort of programs that can be offered, and ultimately on the fees that will be paid by parents, so many of whom struggle to make the choice to be able to send their children to a school that they aspire to receive the best education. I'm very fortunate today to have a very distinguished lineup of speakers. Christopher Pine is the Shadow Minister for Education. He is somebody who is very passionate about this issue. Christopher first came to the Parliament when he was elected at the age of 25. He's travelled here from South Australia to be with us this evening to present the Coalition's policy on the Gonski Review and on the importance of funding independent schools. We also have with us today Michelle Green, the Chief Executive of Independent Schools Victoria. And just to give you a bit of background, she represents over 221 diverse schools with 127,000 students in Victoria. So she, she packs a punch here on this debate. And Ross Fox, who is the Director of Policy Research and Communications at the Catholic Education Office. And he, in turn, also speaks for over 329 schools and 146,000 students in Melbourne, of which St Kevin's, of course, is also a part. These issues are important to all of us. It's important that our children receive the very best our education system has to offer, and it's important that parents have choice in their education options. If we do not properly fund the independent school sector, we will see that choice diminished, and ultimately everyone will pay for that, not only today, but well into the future. Tonight, we will have all of our speakers give a short presentation, and then it is very much an opportunity to hear your comments, for you to ask questions um, and we'll ultimately wrap up um, just before seven o'clock, but earlier if we finish before then. So without further ado, I would like to very much welcome Christopher Pine here tonight to speak with us and present 
the, the Coalition's policy on independent school funding. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you very much, Kelly. It's a great pleasure to be here in Higgins. I'm travelling all around Australia uh, in this break, uh, right through to the mid-year, to talk about the Gonski Review uh, and what it means for non-government school and government school, but particularly in this environment, non-government school funding. Uh, it is the most important report on education uh, in a generation, a school education, and it has enormous implications for uh, non-government schools like St Kevin's and all the others that are represented here. Can I also thank Stephen for hosting us tonight at St Kevin's. It's a wonderful venue uh, and I look forward to hearing from you about your opinions, views and impressions of what's going on in the non-government school space uh, and perhaps sharing the Coalition's uh, uh, immediate response to the release of the Gonski Review. Can I say at the outset that there are good aspects to the Gonski Review. It is a good body of work. Uh, David Gonski is a good man and uh, his panel uh, has done an excellent job at understanding the entire sector and coming up with su some suggestions about how to uh, recreate uh, the funding of non-government schools uh, in Australia. Uh, there are some aspects of it that the Coalition uh, is attracted to and will implement uh, to varying degrees in government should we be elected at the next election. Things like the uh, support for students with disabilities, uh, the loadings issues for Indigenous children, uh, low SES children, literacy and numeracy and so forth. Uh, most of those areas uh, most people could agree on. Uh, the problem with the Gonski Review uh, is that uh, planning non-government school funding around the Gonski Review for the next 12 years uh, is a bit like planning your family budget uh, over winning Powerball on Thursday night. There isn't $113 billion uh, of new money to be spent on education, 70% uh, from the states and 30% from the Commonwealth. So planning uh, the future of non-government school funding around Gonski uh, requires you to make the leap into the unreality that there is $113 billion of new funding. No matter how much uh, you are passionate about school education and think that is a worthy ideal, uh, it is uh, utterly unachievable. And therefore the Coalition's approach to this is to be highly sceptical of what a Labor government would do uh, to implement the Gonski Review, knowing that they won't have that money. Now, Bill Daniels from the uh, Independent Schools Australia has quite rightly said that if there's no money, there's no model. The Catholic school systems are very suspicious of what the government would do uh, without that money being pumped into the system. David Gonski himself has said that the $5 billion is what is needed to make the model work. Uh, and that, in spite of the fact that there is great uncertainty about just what this model means, even to the point where David Gonski has said that the SES funding model uh, is the best that's been come up with so far in terms of the data to be used to determine funding for non-government schools, uh, and in the light of there being a better model, uh, the government should continue the SES funding model. So there is real doubt about how the government will proceed knowing there aren't those funds to put into the education space. And for the coalition, uh, knowing Labor's record, on non-government school funding, uh, we are concerned primarily about three things that they could do. Uh, they could decide to take the Gonski recommendation about the real capacity to pay of parents in non-government schools and develop that into a means test. Now you can call it a means test or you can call it capacity to pay. Uh, capacity to pay is a euphemism for a means test by any other name. Uh, and what that means uh, would mean the government applying the real capacity of parents to pay uh, to non-government schools and determining funding on that basis. Uh, without the extra money, that would have to mean a cut to funds to non-government schools. Uh, we are concerned that when they say indexation is conceived of in the Gonski Review, which it is, uh, if the percentage of indexation in the future is not 6%, if it's anything less than that, that is a real cut to non-government schools. 
And if it's anything between zero and six, if it's zero, it's a $4.2 billion cut to non-government schools in the next quadrennium. Uh, and if it's anything between zero and six, it's obviously a cut. Uh, unless it's six, it is a real cut to non-government schools. And the government, as you know, they've been asked in every possible way by the Catholic education system and the independent school system, uh, whether they're committed to indexation, they simply repeat the same mantra, no school will lose one dollar. Now, we're not all stupid. We know what that means is that they'll get their current quantum, but without indexation, there's a real cut to non-government schools. And thirdly, we're concerned that they might cherry pick the possibility of a minimum contribution by parents in non-government schools. So essentially setting school fees. Now, 10% doesn't sound like a great deal of money until you recognise that in Queensland alone, in the Catholic system, there are 292 schools and 77 of those schools, so around a quarter, actually charge their parents less than 10% in those schools because that system cross-subsidises across the system to ensure that Catholic parents who want to choose Catholic education can afford to do so and be subsidised by those parents who have greater means at their disposal. A system that's worked very well. The same principle applies to Jewish schools and Muslim schools and Greek Orthodox schools where Kelly and I were this afternoon. So we are concerned that the government will cherry pick some of those ideas. We have other concerns about the Gonski Review. We don't support school planning authorities. Uh, we don't believe that a school planning authority uh, based on a geographic area, including all the schools in it, with a board made up of the Australian Education Union, uh, government schools, non-government schools, state governments, federal governments, and whoever else they decide to put on this board, uh, will objectively analyse the needs of schools for infrastructure spending in a particular geographic area. And given the history of the non-Labor side of politics, uh, in the Hawke-Keating era, they basically had a no new schools policy, which the Howard government swept away, which led to a blossoming of non-government schools, in most cases low-fee Christian schools and non-Christian schools across the sector. Um, this school planning authority would have the real potential to do two things, to stop new schools in the non-government space and stop non-government schools from having uh, the infrastructure they need in their own area. If the government has that much control over the kind of capital that schools can raise in the non-government sector and what, the, what support they'll get from government, uh, I have been in politics long enough to believe that as most of these groups always offer by, uh, operate by consensus, the likelihood is very few times will non-government schools uh, win that contest for new infrastructure funding. And as you would all know, there is always a need for infrastructure funding in non-government schools in the same way as there is in government schools. Uh, and I don't think that school planning authorities should determine those outcomes. We also don't support a national school resource authority uh, that sets how the states, how much money the states and territories should spend, how much money the Commonwealth should spend, how much that should be spent per student. Um, I don't believe that well, Western Australia has already said that they won't sign up to any model like that, uh, and I don't understand why the states would do that, given that education, uh, along with health, are two of the core businesses of state governments. Uh, and if you are going to have state governments doing real things, obviously education uh, at the school level is a vitally important part of what they do. Uh, we have other concerns about the Gonski Review. I'm concerned how Labor will respond to it primarily. Uh, I'm mindful that in 2004 they had their now infamous private school hit list. That didn't work for them politically because the non-government school sector quite sensibly said, well, they're coming for the so-called 67 elite schools this time, but who will it be next time? And the sector stuck together and made sure that they didn't get picked off by the 2004 Labor policy. In 2007, and again in 2010, Labor simply rolled over the SES funding model. 
the so-called hated SES funding model that Labor, whether it's Julie Gillard or Stephen Smith, the Shadow Minister for Education, or countless backbenchers have described as being pernicious and uh, inequitable and everything else. Uh, they kept that in 2007, they kept it in 2010 because they didn't want to buy this fight with the non-government school sector. And my view is that the uncertainty that's been created, the implementation groups, the working groups, the, con the ongoing studies, the fact that the Minister Peter Garrett said today we haven't even costed this model because we haven't even agreed to it yet, but apparently all this is going to be done by the end of the year uh, in a legislative sense and passed. But my view is the government is setting themselves up to be able to say we've run out of time and we're going to extend the SES funding model for another year to get them through another election. So Labor will want to have got through three elections, 07, 10 and 12, 13, whenever the election's held, without actually putting their cards on the table for what they want to do with non-government schools. The Coalition's position is, is this. We have a, a rolled gold promise to the non-government school sector that will continue to fund their current quantum of money plus 6% indexation, which is $4.2 billion over the next four-year quadrennium. We've made that promise because we think that principals and bursars and school governing councils and so on uh, need to have certainty. A school is not something that can chop and change from month to month or year to year. They need to know how much money they're going to have, how many students they can therefore enrol, how many teachers they can therefore employ over a period of time into the future. It's not fair on a non-government school sector to expect them to simply, on a wing and a prayer, operate their schools. We believe that if the purpose of schooling is to get the best possible outcomes for students, then the issue in this area is not money. Uh, Mr Garrett's fond of saying that the governments have spent 44% more on education in the last four and a half years. And that of course is the building the education revolution money and the computers and schools money. Uh, he's also fond of saying that the non-government sector has spent 25% more in the last four and a half years. But in the last 10 years, our outcomes for our students have declined. So clearly, money is not the issue in terms of the quality of our education. And the three things that co the Coalition thinks are the most important things to focus on are quality teaching, a robust curriculum, and principal autonomy in the government sector. They are the things the Coalition will focus on in government. So we, most of those things, by the way, don't cost a tremendous amount of money. In fact, hardly anything, because most of them are governance issues, curriculum issues, uh, and quality teaching, from the Commonwealth's point of view, is about the curriculum in the teachers' colleges that currently exist in universities. Uh, and principal autonomy uh, is something that we would work with the states to implement. So our policy is very clear. The government's policy is very murky. Uh, today, Peter Garrett said that the government was a long way from committing $5 billion a year on $2,009 to the non-government and government school sector. And you know as well as I do that the states do not have 70% of $113 billion between 2014 and 2025. So I might leave it there, and because uh, I know that there are other people who need to speak, and then obviously have a broader discussion when um, we get to uh, comments and questions and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher, and I'd now like to invite Michelle Breen to speak from the Independent Schools, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you, and it's good to see so many friends here. Thank you, Kelly, for the um, invitation to speak. It's good to sit on a podium with Christopher and yourself and Ross. Um, and thank you also to my chairman, who's here, Jeremy Kirkwood. Nice to see you, Jeremy. I'm going to uh, use slides, which means I need to be able to find... Is this the mouse here? Please, I need to be able to find these slides here. I've been using an iPad for so long that um, I think that if you just touch it, it's going to work, but obviously not. And it's very bright, isn't it? One thing about independent schools, Victoria, you can't miss us. 
the school funding of the Gonski Review. Now I'm going to give this presentation knowing that many of you will have seen variations of these slides. Instead I seem to have been giving presentations around variations of these slides which change daily since the Gonski Review was, um, was released. You could probably call, and I'm hoping it's, uh, this presentation though, oh, rogue apostrophe, too many ifs and buts. <laughs> People say to me, well, the Gonski Review has uh, said that there'll be more money for non-government schools. Why are you upset? Surely more money is a good thing. And I say, more money is a good thing, but this money comes with too many ifs and buts. And why? Let's just recap. The Gonski Review was commissioned in April 2010. Great fanfare. I think that uh, Kevin Rudd probably had a brain snap in the shower and thought to himself, good idea, we'll do a total review, not just a small review, but a big review. And we'll review all funding and we'll get an eminent person to head up the review. And this is what we want to do. We want to develop a funding system that is transparent, fair, financially sustainable and promotes excellent outcomes. Fantastic thing to do. And so uh, David Gonski was sent on a listening tour of all the states and territories, and all key stakeholders were consulted. I was one of them. I think I had nearly an hour and a half, and um, I don't know if it was a listening to it so much as a discussion about very um, obtruse concepts. Of course, in the middle of that time, there was a change of government, a change of, well, not a change of government, a change of um, Prime Minister. And so by the time Gonski asked for submissions, the former Education Minister, Julia Gillard, was the, um, was the Prime Minister. So 7,000 submissions, four commissioned research papers for comment, hundreds of meetings, and the result was the Gonski Report came down in February, 26 findings, 41 recommendations, and the projected cost to implement as you saw. Now, for those of you who didn't see, there are a whole lot of wonderful cartoons that came out um, and on, as the Gonski report was released. I don't know if you can see this one, it's quite beautiful. It's um, Peter Garrett fronting the Surplus Revolution Band. There's Wayne Swan here on the fiscal drums. And Julia Gillard with her score sheet here. By the way, he's singing The Power and the Surplus. Um, and Gonski comes in with the tuba. And the tuba says, five billion for schools. And Julia says, not yet, Gonski. And I think if, if anybody was going to um, sum up the government response to Gonski, that slide does, because they said all of these wonderful things, blah, 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 but basically, we're going to talk about it. We're going to consult. This is the second cartoon. This is beautiful. Viva la education revolution. This is the storming of the Bastille, except it's the storming, sorry about the, the poor quality of this slide, it's the storming of the full school's federal funding Bastille. And Julia Gillard's leading the stakeholders, Le Gilardine, forward to a thorough and considered process of community engagement in an ongoing and evolving consultative process to model and refine possible options for any future school's funding. And um, Peter Garrett's here with a whiteboard marker, whiteboard marker, anyone. Okay, so what does it mean? Now I know Ross. Ross and I have worked together for some time. I know he's going to explain all this to you, so I'm going to skip over it really quickly. But this is what SES funding, the SES funding model now looks like. So basically, you can see that the slope of the, 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 slope of the line is like this. That at the, very, the most needy independent and Catholic schools receive at, the, at most 70% of Australian government schools' recurrent cost. And the least needy at 130 SES, remember the highest SES in Victoria is 128, received 13.7% of AGSRC. What this slide shows unequivocally is that not one non-government school student receives more money than a student in a government school. Easy. So why would we complain then about a funding proposal from the Commonwealth where the line looks like this? where a bit further along there's a drop. This is here, $10,000 is around about the new student resource standard. Every government school in the country would receive that amount, no matter what the capacity of their parents to pay would be. And the slope would change so that at the very needy schools would receive 90% of the student resource standard, which looks like AGSRC, the Australian Government Schools Recurrent Cost. 
and the least, so-called least needy schools would receive 20 to 25 per cent of the student resource standard. It means more money for everybody, doesn't it? it? Means more money for everybody. Who could complain about this? Well, who could complain about this on the face of it? But this is the important line here. See this blue line at the bottom? The blue line is the Victorian government per capita funding. And the issue about Gonski is that the Gonski Review says that all of the money should go together into one pot and it should all be allocated out of the one pot. And the fact is that this line looks like this for Victoria. It probably looks like this for Western Australia and it probably looks like this for Queensland. Now the issue is nobody knows what the pot would look like and nobody knows from Gonski how it is that this would be allocated. So this is significant, this is just this one for secondary schools in case you were wondering if we only did primary. So the issue for this is no matter how you cut the figures, there's not enough certainty in the Gonski report to understand what a school is going to be paid. And Christopher talked about the loadings. You'd have to wonder about a model that treats um, different areas of disadvantage differently. Yes, we all think, I think they stole this from us actually, the Gonski Review. Everybody thinks that the per student disability, this is great, I think my system's shutting down. Shall I do this, see what happens? Ah. Perhaps someone's giving me a message, are they? I can move this to the side with the mouse. So move this. Right, that should be fast, I tell you. <laughs> this is, is this a new way of letting me know that I need to uh, I need to finish in a hurry? Okay, how about if somebody who knows more about this than I do comes to move this while I talk fast? Because I can't, I cannot move it. All right. Press from press on. I did. No, no, it's not responding. Press on both. It's not this one. And here's another. X marks the spot, except if it's St it's Kevin's. Okay, beautiful. Anyway, so what it means here is, oh, maybe I can keep moving that slide. Why is it that you would have a disability um, loading, which is a per student loading, which is a great thing, but why would you then have concentration of disadvantaged loadings, which apply to English language proficiency and Indigenous students? Because once you do this, it means that schools in Victoria and New South Wales the small in area but large in population states actually lose money. So, ah, so, if accepted, these are the Gonski recommendations. Extra school funding of $5 billion. That's an extra, uh, additional $113 billion over the 12-year cycle. But what is the hidden cost? As Christopher said, what we've done is we've gone through on $2,009 and we have modelled what it actually means if you run a 12-year cycle at $5 billion a year extra in $2,009. And what you get is a whopping $112.8 billion needed over a 12-year cycle if you use indexation at the, at the current rate, so we're running at about 6%. I was briefing the Greens earlier this week and they said, oh, don't be silly, it would never be 6%. Let's go for CPI. So just for you, just to show you we've done the work, even if it was at CPI, it would still be 82.2 billion over the 12 years. It's a lot of money. And then today, how wonderful, um, Brianna Tucker writes that um, the uh, minister says this, financial modelling is expected to reveal that the initial call for $5 billion investment fell severely short. So if it did fall severely short, what does it do to that? And I love this clip from today. Mr Garrett confirmed, oh no, this one not from today, this is from 2011, just to remind you that he did say that we were going to legislate changes for this year, next year, 2012. If we decide to make changes and they require legislation, we want to bring legislation into the House next year and have that concluded before the next election. Now, what's the difference between these two slides? The difference is probably $112 billion. So if accepted, the Gonski recommendations are this. 
Funding needs to be based on parents' capacity to pay. But is this means testing? Well, it sounds like means testing to me. Capacity to pay. There'll be a new system of government funding, but nobody knows if schools will get less because they get fees and donations. Because nobody knows whether that will be factored into capacity to pay. Here's the quote about capacity, capacity to contribute. And just to be fair, I did put in the quote from Peter Garrett where he said it's not a means test. Christopher talked about this minimum private contribution of 10% of SRS. This is the one factor that really, really concerns independent schools because it means that at the very neediest parents would have to pay 10%. So what is that except a means test and a pretty nasty one at that? And these schools, the non-government schools, would be fully funded and I've gone to groups of independent schools in Victoria, about 15 of them might qualify, and I've said this would be great news, all you have to do is apply and there'll be somebody around to help you, and they've said, but will we still be independent schools? That is what we want. So there are no commitments from the Australian Government, just more consultations. But, as Christopher says, parents have to manage household budgets this year and they need to plan for coming years. And the people that phone us talk about the uncertainty and talk about what's going to happen to fees. And now, of course, I read it in the paper today, I'll be able to say, well, the model's not government policy. It's just an idea. But I'll also be able to say, with hand on heart, that education reforms should be above state and federal politics. So you know what? If it doesn't make it into the federal budget and it doesn't make it into the state budget, Whose fault is it when it's not delivered? Well, it's the state's. And it means that I can go to an election if I'm the government and say, I tried. And all I have to do is negotiate through COAG with a whole lot of premiers of different political persuasion and we'll get it through, just you wait and see. And by the way, while we're doing that, let's give people a little bit of extra money um, and, oh, where are we going to get that money? Well. We've got to negotiate a new schools agreement, a new funding agreement with the independents. So maybe we'll start with that. And there we are back exactly where we started, where before Kevin Rudd had the brain snap in the shower. Okay, I put this up because what I've been doing is using the text from this flyer, which we have produced, many of you will see it, have seen it, and uh, lots of parents, I think, will have seen this flyer. It um, really encourages people to raise concerns with their Member of Parliament, but also to tell the government that they need to know if, when and how school funding will be changed, because I don't think it's good enough to go forward knowing that there is a timetable like this. This is a timetable out of Golski. February 2012 down to January 2014. Gonski said, this, if you want to do this, this is the timetable you will have to meet. We're in April 2012. Supposedly we've had an initial response. Well, yeah, the initial response was we need to talk about it. It's proposed that in April that COAG meets to agree on the principles. And the discussion today, the, the, the speech today that was quoted in the papers, talks about how it would be very, very sad if the Premiers would not agree to the principles. We are already behind time. This is the, really, the thing that really worries us, though, independent and Catholic schools. Final confirmation of 2014 funding amounts for schools needs to come November, December 2013. Before that time, there will need to be some legislation about our funding. We've run out of time. And of course, somebody's run out of money because, this is great, there's a draft work timetable for the SPU group. I love the SPU group. They're going to commission, again, some more external consultants for advice on particular aspects of the new funding model. So the SPU group are going to have to get together to do all of this in order for us to be happy. And of course, they still need the money. Now, people have said to me, what would fix it? We, the government has spent a lot of money on the Gonski Review. David Gonski's come up with a wonderful document, what would fix it? And what I've said is, well, 
In the first instance, what you could do if you were cynical, if you were a Labor government and you wanted to go to an election without anybody fighting you, what you'd do is you'd extend non-government funding for one more year so that when you went to an election, you could say to all of those parents out there and all of the principals, you could say, you know what, we're still consulting. So we'll just pay you as we were. I'm not quite sure about indexation, but we'll pay you as we were. There's nothing to worry about because we support you. My view is that is probably what will happen. How much does this cost? How much is it going to keep costing us? And is there going to be a result that works for parents and students and improves student outcomes overall? Well, nobody knows that. I'll only say one thing more, and that is that the financial review, just after the Gonski report was released, there was a, a, um, a lovely back page article. And the article said, this government has taken on the miners and they initially lost but the miners are pussycats compared to the independent schools lobby. <laughs> I wish that was true. We'll see how we go. Thanks. Do you know what, Michelle? You can come to all of the seminars with Christopher right around the country. I think you put that really beautifully, very succinctly and very, very clearly. And we really, really thank you for sharing that information with us tonight. I also wanted to introduce Inga Palik, who is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Education Minister here in Victoria. We're very grateful that you've been able to come along this evening, Inga, because as you know from the presentation just now, this is about state and federal funding and decisions that the federal government is going to make with respect to that and the independent school sector. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ross Fox from the Catholic Education Office here in Victoria, Director of Policy. Thank you very much, Ross. Soldier on, shall I? It's made, made the presentation for your benefit very short. I might just uh, start with a few comments. I'd like to thank Stephen. Um, it's the first time I actually am um, also the Executive Officer of the Catholic Education Commission. We take about $1.7 in government funding. We distribute it to around 500 schools and 200,000 students in Victoria. It's the first time I've had the pleasure of coming to St Kevin's, but like many schools I've been to, you drive into the campus and you know immediately that this is a special place of education, a special place for young men um, to be educated. And that was quite clear. Um, so thank you for hosting tonight, Stephen. Kelly, uh, many of the Catholic school principals in your area speak very highly um, of your continuing advocacy and contribution in education. So thanks for the opportunity to be part of it. Christopher, um, we all hear very often um, your valiant efforts to speak on behalf of choice in education, and it's something Catholic Education continues to agree with and support and endorse. Um, Michelle, thanks. I did work with Michelle for an amount of time, um, and I, it's very clear the insight that she's brought tonight, so she's made my job very easy. Um, I'd just like to recognise Senator Scott Ryan. He's actually got a long history in his family of association with Catholic Education. His mother is currently an acting principal, of a Catholic primary school, so it's, uh, and I know that in the room there are many um, eminent educators, so I appreciate that I'm not an educationalist, um, but spend a lot of time thinking about these issues, and I would like to recognise Inga Palich, the Parliamentary Secretary for Education, who has also uh, got a history as an educator and a teacher. So, just as background, as I said, um, I want, to, I want to start by saying why this is important, why what we're talking about tonight is important. That's the enrolments in Catholic schools across Victoria in the last 10 years. Um, we've built um, the equivalent of eight or nine St Kevin's um, secondary schools. We've grown by about 15,000 students in 10 years. So that's the task. It's actually um, more challenging than that. We're building primary schools in the north and the west of Melbourne, one to two a year. So we've built in the order of the equivalent of 30 primary schools over that time. So the task is really challenging and it matters that we have a stable and sound funding base to meet the needs of parents throughout Victoria and throughout Melbourne. 
Just want to share, um, you might be under the impression that Catholic and independent schools are doing very well. We're flush with money. Michelle's observation was very pertinent. There's not an independent school that gets more government funding than any government school, and you might not believe that from what you read in the paper. But those are the most detailed figures, and I've just put government and Catholic schools there. Now, this is averages. We know we represent in the system a great diversity of schools, but this is the average for Victoria. And what it says is that this is just recurrent costs, not capital, but it says that the average government school student in Victoria costs 10708 and in Victoria, they pay in government schools or make the greatest private contribution in the country an average of about $887. You'd think that government schools were free, but rightly, parents in their local community are choosing to contribute to the government school too. Now, in Catholic schools, um, we're operating on about $7,785 um, in government funding, combined Commonwealth state, and parents contribute on average $1,894 for a total of 9,679. So in broad terms, we operate even with parent fees on about 90% of the cost of education in government schools and about 80% of um, the total cost, every dollar that goes to a government school student, we get about 80 cents to support one of our students. Now the reality is that's a big saving. Parents make big sacrifices and that's demonstrated here. So if you read the dominant narrative, often you think that we were getting a lot more government funding. We've actually done some research that shows people think we do get more government funding and that therefore any, any government funding needs to be taken off us and given to someone else. And that just is totally counter to the reality. So these are the best available figures, the most detailed analysis. Now, so just to show the breakup, we're turning over just this year, we've just hit over $2 billion for Catholic education in Victoria, and that's the breakup. Um, about 64% Australian government, 17% state government, and parent and other income, 19%. Now, some of these numbers will bear no relationship to what parents in the room feel or what principals charge their parents. And the reason for that is because there's significant capital costs in running facilities as great as this. Um, and every school feels that. So there's more needed from parents to support capital projects, to support maintenance to support technology initiatives. Um, so the sacrifice parents are making, the commitment they're making is even bigger than this. Now, very simply, there's three things Catholic education was after through the Gonski Review. We wanted additional funding to close the gap we knew existed, the gap that's borne out by those figures. Um, and so we need additional funding because what that gap hides is the fact that we find it incredibly difficult to give the funds that students with disability need to give the funds that Indigenous students need to support their learning, autistic children, all the children with special needs, we struggle to support because we don't have the funding to support them. The second point is we need government funding that keeps pace with actual costs, with the cost of educating a child in a government school. The reality is if our funding changes by CPI, it implies teachers' salaries have to be going up by less than CPI because we've got exposed to other costs. We've heard a lot of commentary in the newspaper about energy costs. Schools pay a lot of energy costs and they're going up all the time. So our funding needs to keep pace with actual costs, not some mythical benchmark devised in a back room. It's got to be able to support the increasing learning demands and learning needs of children. And the third point, as I said, we need fair funding for students with disability in particular and other students with other needs so that we can actually meet their learning needs and give them the best chance. So those are the three things we asked for. Now the review panel said, now Michelle's gone in very detail, I'm just going to superficially go over it because I don't want to prolong my conversation and there's some rich conversation that I think can happen um, with the panel. But as we, we know that they've said five billion, we understand that's, that means about 750 million for Victoria, as the Victorian government contributing. Um, the reality is the Department of Education is cutting central costs and in that environment it's very difficult to find another $750 million. The Victorian government's recently had their GST revenue cut by about $4 billion over four years. So there's just not much money around and the idea that the Victorian government can find $750 and the million and the Australian government can find $1.5 billion. Particularly today we heard the Treasurer saying we've got to return to surplus. 
It's very difficult to work out where that money's going to come from. They recommended a new funding model, which I'll describe briefly, and they recommended, as Michelle indicated, uh, funding based on a school's capacity to contribute. And really, that, that name hides a lot of things, a lot of concepts, because they're really talking about parents. That's the quote that Michelle put up, it's parent capacity to contribute. Um, and I'll go into some implications for that. And they're talking about additional funding for students with disability, which we're very excited about, because we think that'll address an injustice in the current model. But um, as for there being other problems, we, we don't see them. Now, I won't go through this in detail for limitations of time, but there's been a lot of sort of qualified support. There's been a few reservations and a few middle of the road. Now, I prepared this sort of a week ago, so maybe I should have um, Prime Minister Gillard and um, Peter Garrett moving further to the reservation column um, than actually uh, being in the middle ground because um, they appear to be getting more reserved. But there's been a lot of commentary, not all of it in my view, um, particularly about the detailed funding model, um, very informed because we're really wanting to test assumptions because we can't work. And I'll show you some, some quite um, confidential work we've done and I'll be happy to share it with you. Um, some illustration of some of the problems. But as it goes back, we've heard some comments. We can't afford to do more with less, um, we're, given where we're starting from. And any freeze to Catholic school funding is really a cut for us, because we need to keep meeting the learning needs of those students. So we can't be penalised for good performance. We need to help to do better and to take the pressure off government schools. Because we know if you put pressure on us, where are parents going to go? They've got to go back to government schools and that's got costs for everyone and it's not what the parents currently want. Um, so this, is, this describes the model. If you want to look at the Gonski review, you can see it. Conceptually, they're saying that you can put a price, as Michelle described, on an individual student and then they'll get additional funding for needs. So I won't go into that. You can read up on it. That's straight out of the funding report as well. You can go and have a look. Very complicated. So I attempted to simplify it. And I just want to spend one minute on this. The red line at the top, the schooling resource standard, this report says you can calculate a cost of education for every student in Australia, really a vanilla student in a vanilla school with no additional needs. Down the bottom, that, that bottom axis, school capacity to pay, they really talk about parent capacity to pay. And if you're talking about parent capacity to pay, you assume they mean income and assets. We're not really sure what else they might mean. Um, and whether that's an asset test or a means test, given it's about income and assets, that's for you to work out. Dollars per student. Um, so what they say is there's a public contribution, as Michelle said, ranging from 90% to 25%, and the anticipated parental contribution, 10% to 75%. Now, two important observations. This is only recurrent funding. Doesn't begin to, to start to deal with the cost of maintaining facilities. And this doesn't include targeted programs or things for need. So if you've got a student with disability, this model at the moment doesn't fund it within that framework. It's got a separate way of doing it. So we did some initial, um, and you can do this yourself. If you go to my school and have a look, you can show that what I'm saying is true. So for a primary school, the school resource standard calculated for 2009 was $8,000, okay? So what we did, we went to, we've got very sophisticated databases, but we went and had a look at one school. Um, so the implication of this graph is that the black line represents the level of government funding that a school should get. Now, this is, the reason this is illustrative, because it's not a precise science, we've got to make assumptions, but the green line represents the current funding that one of our Catholic primary schools in Higgins gets, it's St Anthony's Primary, Glen Huntley. It's recurrent only, um, and they get $7,163 in government funding per student. Now you can see the black line is somewhat lower than that amount. Now, and, and the SES of that school is 115, so it's, it's sort of middle class to advantage. So, but they're saying the Gonski model has an idea about how much government funding that school should get. The red box represents the fees that those parents currently pay recurrent only. They're not, that doesn't include the capital they have to contribute to. 
and at the moment it's $1,319, $1,319. You can see in theory under this model, that red box needs to meet the black line. Um, it's somewhat smaller than what is suggested. Now, people say that we're a system and we can reallocate uh, money to try and make up for things like this. The problem is that we're not sure where we're meant to get the money from. Um, at the moment in Victoria, we get a, a sort of a system allocation of about 150 million that we use to distribute um, across the system for needs. And it comes from schools like St Kevin's, who are part of the system, um, because we did a deal, an arrangement to keep fees low across the system when the SES model started. And that's, there's a long history that we could discuss in detail. But that's the reality um, of a primary school that you can find for yourself and you can show yourself that graph. Um, so it's the implications of that um, are relatively clear. So we've got a problem, where do we get money to to support that school if we're going to be funded by that model that's been proposed? So there's been an announcement today by Minister Garrett that we're going to look at detailed modelling. We've got a fairly good idea, we think, of where the modelling ends up and what it shows in circumstances like this. So we also did something cheeky, Stephen, we put St Kevin's um, on there. Um, and what we found, St Kevin's SES is 120. That 120 hides, as you know, a diversity of parents, a diversity of capacities. And what we found is that the government funding is somewhat above, that green bar, somewhat above, um, and it's hard to place it precisely, but it's definitely above um, that black line. Now, the red line does make up the difference at the moment, but the question is, you've got a given quality of education in St Kevin's, in whatever school you happen to be associated with. If that bar has to increase to maintain that quality, if the parent contribution has to increase, um, that's going to put more and more of a burden on, just to hold constant the quality of your teachers, the quality of your facilities. Well, facilities aren't even paid for out of this. That's on top. That's why I'm sure the $9,400 doesn't bear direct correspondence to what fees are charged because there's a lot more that has to go into a quality school. So the point is, and we, we can, you can do this for yourself, play a game, we can go and look um, where your schools fit. Um, but we've got reservations, we don't understand how this model can fund quality education in the way that's happening at the moment. And we've got a briefing tomorrow where we might be enlightened but um, it's very difficult to see how that works. So I'll leave it there. I've got lots of other slides that describe further some of the issues, but I think that puts it in the stark clarity as to some of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Look, thank you very much, Ross. That was, um, that was a very powerful illustration of exactly what we're concerned about here tonight. And we now have the opportunity over the next uh, 20 minutes uh, to seek comments from the audience, any questions that anybody might have of any of the panellist members. The only thing I would actually ask that you do is state your name, the school that you're part of and who you would like to direct your question to. So I think, I'm not sure if we do have a microphone, but Lachlan's got a microphone that he'll um, bring up to anybody who might have a question that they would like to ask or any information that they would like to share. Do I have any starters? Is it all crystal clear for everybody here? Everyone's in shock. Everyone's in shock. Everyone's in shock. Well, um, while somebody's actually thinking about a question they might ask, uh, I, I think what is borne out by the presentation from all of our speakers tonight is that we need to provide further information to schools and to parents in particular about the implications that will flow from changes to independent school funding. I know I have so many very esteemed principals here in the room in the Higgins electorate and so many school councils, uh, chairmen and treasurers and uh, interested parents as well. And I think the key takeaway for me is that despite the fact that I have delivered now three speeches in the Parliament about the importance of this issue, each one of us needs to be able to go away and activate the communities that we are involved in in order to provide them with information so that they too can ask the questions that need to be asked so that we might get 
the answers from the government on this. Now, any other, any questions that I might have here? Does anybody on the, oh yes, yes. Yeah, well, the acoustics aren't too bad, but we'll, um, we'll give, you a, give you a mic. That one's pretty quick. <laughs> Jeremy Kirkman, I'm chair of ISV, and also chair of Geelong Grammar School, so a bit of a friendly question to maybe kick things off. Uh, in the means testing or capacity to pay issue, could someone on the panel or all of you make a comment about how Ixia um, is related to that? I think there's a lot of confusion out there with the mask of websites about what Ixia is and how that might be used in some sort of means testing. Do you want to start, Chris? Yes. Yep. Thank you. The, um... Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, it was one of the things I would have covered, but they wanted short speeches, so I left it out. But I mean, one of the uh, the tests that the coalition is going to apply or is applying to our response to the Gonski review is the uh, is an objective test, uh, is an objective model. Now, the SES funding model is apparently you know the worst model ever devised, uh, except the, all the others, which because uh, it hasn't been replaced. Uh, and it is an objective test. It's based on the ABS data collected in the census, and uh, it's obviously a criminal act to, to lie on the census. And I don't know anybody who bothers to lie on the census because you simply get it and you fill it out. Now, the SES funding model is based on that data. Uh, the problem with the Gonski Review's response to that is they've thrown up hints and suggestions of what else could be used beside the SES funding model. One of those is the ICSIA score. Now, we know that the ICSIA score is very dodgy. Apparently, the most privileged school in Victoria is the Montessori School in North East Victoria, uh, where the principal themselves pointed out the gutters that were overflowing in their school because they didn't have uh, uh, infrastructure spending to fix them. And yet, ICSIA says they're the most privileged school in Victoria. Uh, one of the most privileged schools, which Geelong Grammar would be a bit of a surprise to like Geelong Grammar, Jeremy. But, the, the other school that was apparently the most privileged school in Australia was a school of about 20 Indigenous students west of Alice Springs, which I think would have come as a surprise to the principal of that school too. <laughs> so the ICSIA score is not reliable. The other hint that the Gonski Review gave was that they could use the NAP plan to determine resources because they were picking reference schools uh, of schools that had 80% uh, success rate with the NAP plan schools. Well, the NAPLAN data was never designed to be used as a resource uh, base uh, for schools. It is a diagnostic tool. Uh, it is useful for principals, for teachers, for some parents who can understand it. Um, but it's not a resourcing standard. And I think it's a fundamental flaw of this model to suggest that NAPLAN should be included uh, as part of the resourcing standard. Uh, it flies in the face of uh, what we already know about NAPLAN, which is that it's also unreliable. The publication of the NAPLAN data has led to uh, isolated cases of cheating by teachers, changing scores, uh, but we also know two things that are not isolated. Uh, teaching to the test uh, and also asking particular students to stay home on the day that the NAPLAN is being conducted. Um, I have twins. Uh, and I also have a nine-year-old and a four-year-old. The twins are 11 and a half, so I have a very unique insight into how the NAP plan operates. Uh, and while I certainly won't put any teachers in, I know one of my children, who's one of the twins, didn't even know the NAP plan was occurring until the day the NAP plan test happened, and the other one had been planning for the NAP plan for four or five weeks before it occurred, uh, and that is because of the publication of the NAP plan data. Uh, if the NAP plan data wasn't being published, it would be a pure diagnostic tool, uh, because it is being published, it is being distorted. So that's the last um, uh, data that should be used to determine this resource. Yeah. Are there any journalists in the room? Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Please <laughs> find the index of community socio-economic educational disadvantage. Not economic advantage. Ixia is actually ranking people based on their education scores, and it's not a very good ranking. So the issue is, when Barry McGaw and Akara set up, this is one of all these acronyms, isn't it? When Akara set up Ixia, they said Ixia should never be used for funding. That's right. And yet, Akara provided advice to the Gonski Review 
about how Ixia could be modified for funding. So Ixia and funding don't go. That's all. And when I hear people talk about in Ixia as you know, it, somehow it's economic advantage that people are um, are talking about. <laughs> we've done, no, I just want to add to that, we've done, we worked long and hard with ACARA on behalf of Catholic schools to try and get something intelligible um, out of Ixia. Uh, the points to make are Ixia is, it's an index of community socio-educational advantage, as Michelle said. It's meant to predict NAPLAN schools using background factors. Um, it's actually, if you look at the underlying statistical analysis, it's not that great at that. We know in Australia the problem we've got in education is actually variation within schools, not between them. Um, so the ICSIA is actually based on school score, so it hides what's going on at the student level. So it, it automatically removes things that are relevant to individual students. Um, so it's got massive limitations. It, and the thing that we really need, as the point was well made, we need stable funding and certainty. ICSIA changes year to year. Um, but sometimes quite dramatically, and we've seen that. And it, um, you, you shouldn't underestimate some of these small schools, smaller schools, say below 100, um, Ixia starts being quite problematic at showing what's actually going on in the school, which we've heard some illustrations already. Yes. Can everybody hear if we speak from here? Yes. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Alan Blakewood. I'm uh, representing the Children with Disabilities Australia tonight. And I just have to say I'm very pleased with the, uh, the support that Christopher has um, already um, given for the, the disability related um, thinking in Gonski, and also to Michelle and Ross for highlighting that disability is one of those areas that really has to come up to the mark. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we know, um, you know, we, we talk about some things not being all about money, but money is obviously important. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues around disability where, you know, it's individualised funding. Children can, can get, if they're lucky, get some funding and go to a government school. Um, and if that doesn't work, and for a lot of families it doesn't work, um, partly it's because of a mismatch of, you know, personalities. Sometimes schools are naive, sometimes parents are naive. Um, but we see a lot of kids um, wanting to, to access the independent system. Currently they can't because that money is, is tied to government schools. So, we have a lot of kids who are refugees from mainstream government schools, they end up in special schools because naive government schools say we can't meet your child's needs, we better go to a special school. My, one of my sons actually refused enrolment at two different schools and we got the same line, even though we had $30,000 worth of funding to contribute, the schools didn't want us. So, you know, and we know that the Catholic education system does some very creative things um, to try and get around educating kids with disabilities um, without that without that integration funding, including um, mining Medicare, you know, to actually get some Medicare payments for education, which is an outrageous kind of system where you need health dollars to provide education, but that's the way that it is. Um, so we were really pleased to see that the, the portability of disability support was in Gonski. But the, the big question for us is that, you know, we know that the, the capacity of government schools to educate kids with disabilities properly is limited, um, partly because it's a cultural thing, um, and around teacher training. But in independent schools, the capacity, we believe, is probably less because they've had less experience. You know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, I mean, the Catholic system gets some kids that, that you know, you do best with. Other independent schools don't see them because they don't have any funding. You know, and we've, we've had members that have said to us, look, I approached an elite private school where I went, and I was told, yep, yeah, you can enroll your child here, but you've got to pay $30,000 a year above the fees so we can provide an aid. You know, and that's outrageous as well. You know, so the the, the equity line in Gonski is actually quite attractive. But I suppose my question to the panel is, you know, regardless of what happens with the, some of the funding arguments that you've made, um, the fact that you agree that disability is an issue that needs to be worked on, how is how are we going to improve capacity across the system to ensure that, that portability of funding can actually work? You, you want to start, I'll start because what worries me in Gonski, and we all agree that. Um, portability of funding for students with disabilities is a fantastic thing. In Victoria, the Victorian state government, Catholics and independent sector have said, this, we need to do something about this. And nearly three, three years ago, we decided that we'd start the conversation about how it is you define a 
a student with a disability. And once you define a student with a disability, you can actually work out a funding model. And we could do some triangulation between the sector. Sounds right. Three years on, we realise it's not quite that easy to do that. And what worries us is that when we see the Gonski Review, they say we'll set up the SPWG working group and then we've got another minister looking at students with disabilities. They are saying they're going to come up with a definition in two months. So the issue for us is, if you're going to do it, you need to get it right because there are a whole lot of parents out there and a whole lot of students who need support. Um, you don't want to be making a decision about a, dis a, a definition that is this big which locks out all of the children on the outside. And that, to me, is the biggest worry with God's skin students with disability. So you're right to say, we need to keep the government up to this, but I think parents of students with, uh, parents of students with disability and um, the principals need to put pressure on the government to say, do the definition, but get it right. The, the Gonski Review uh, essentially agreed with the Coalition's policy from the last election. So our policy was that we would introduce an education resource card, uh, just an education card actually, and that that would be uh, for children with a disability that would follow the child. It was $20,000 per child, uh, and uh, it wasn't determined on the basis of whether they were in a government school or a non-government school. Now, we think it's outrageous that in Victoria, for example, a child in a government school might attract about $30,000 uh, from the state government, but the same child up there at St Kevin's might, adopt, might attract $3,000. For the coalition, we see that as a social justice issue, uh, and so we also didn't want to get caught up in the weeds of negotiating with state governments about their funding. Uh, we also didn't want them to say, well, if you're going to put X amount of money in, we're going to take Y amount of money out. So we said that we would come in over the top of the states and we would provide an education card for every child with a profound disability, which would be a definition that we would probably take the most uh, generous disability of one state and apply it across the board because the states and territories haven't yet been able to agree, as Michelle points out in the definitions. Uh, and that, that money would be in addition to uh, any other Commonwealth money. Uh, it was a spending commitment that remains an extant policy. Uh, and the Gonski Review has uh, basically said that's how disabilities should be funded. It should be funded on the basis of the child not on the basis of the system that they're in, uh, and uh, that, depending how this plays out, of course, that might end up superseding our policy. I hope it does, because uh, it means the states and territories will also adopt an education card. Uh, so we, we think the disabilities part of the Gonski Review is the best part. Yes, Kevin. Do I need to use the mic? No, I've got your booming voice. Yeah, <laughs> teaching, teaching. It's still with us. Uh, carrying on from portability, there's a big argument overseas in America in particular about vouchers or tax credits. But let's take vouchers. We all agree, I think, in terms of disability, that it was a great policy the coalition took uh, for the last election. I'm surprised Gonski supposedly was at the cutting edge of, of, of research, but in fact, it doesn't talk about vouchers, what's happening in America, for example. What is the panel for you? I mean, I taught at, in government and non-government. Our children went to government and non-government through their career. I would have loved, say, $10,000 that I could simply say, if my child goes to Campbell Grandma, where I taught, they get the $10,000. If they go to Baldwin High, Baldwin High will get the $10,000. So the money would follow the child. And I would argue in terms of equity and social justice, more parents would be able to make the choice. But what's the view about that? Nobody wants to answer, so I'll answer. <laughs> um, well, Kevin, uh, I'm a political pragmatist and a realist. Uh, my view is that if the coalition government is elected, and touch wood they will be, uh, we will be bringing around about a quiet revolution in education. Uh, rather than all the fanfare of the last four and a half years, which has produced essentially nothing good. Um, and the, the real revolution in education uh, is principal autonomy, it's teacher quality, it's how teachers are taught at university, it's raising the standard of teaching so that it becomes an attractive profession. Uh, it's about the curriculum, uh, it's about governance. 
things like what the Western Australian government have done with independent public schools, what New South Wales is starting to do. That's going to be quite a lot to chew on. And uh, uh, what I'm trying to do as the education shadow is fight the fights that uh, need to be fought now. And right now we need to create certainty for non-government schools about their funding. Uh, we need to stop state governments from exiting this space. Uh, we need to do good things for disabilities and bring about a, a quiet revolution I just described. Now, vouchers is not a quiet revolution. <laughs> and deciding to go down the vouchers track would put all the rest at risk and lead to an unholy uh, and probably in the end unsuccessful fight. Uh, because I can't see state and territory governments supporting it. Uh, and um, I don't, while well, I think there's some attractive aspects to the idea of, uh, of uh, the funding following the child, um, having studied it a little bit more closely than I had five or six years ago when I wasn't the shadow, it is fraught with difficulties. And uh, right now I think it's a, it's a more sensible political and pragmatic decision to say, let's fight the battles that we can fight and win, rather than start a whole new fight, which is just going to distract everybody from what we'd like to see uh, in our quiet evolution in 10 years' time. And it's, it's no, it won't be any surprise to any of the independent schools of Victoria members or indeed to Kevin. In our submission, in the independent schools of Victoria's submission to the God's Year Review, we actually put forward a model of vouchers because it's the view of our association that the closer you can get to funding the needs of the individual student in all sectors, then the better funding model you're going to have. Recognising though that there are significant political impediments to achieving that. What we do as an association is we use as a yardstick a little pendulum diagram which says we will assess any funding model based on its closeness to the needs of the individual student. And so we will continue to do that. And you never know, maybe in my lifetime we will have vouchers for, um, for students in Australia. I'm not that old, so. <laughs> uh, just, on, just a quick comment on behalf of Catholic education. Um, Catholic education hasn't seen a voucher model that we're in favour of yet. Um, we've, we have um, great, uh, we place great stock in the ability of a system to address the needs of individual students in individual schools. The reality is that we're quite sceptical that you can sit in one place and think up a perfect funding model for schools. Funding varies in school context dramatically based on things like how new your school is and whether you've reached optimum enrolments. It varies on school size mostly, which has got nothing to do with the needs of the kids mostly. So we need, um, we think, we need a funding system where we can make sort of exceptions and we actually have principals sit around the table and work out the funding model um, year to year, make refinements. We think that's a really good way to do it. And it would be great if we had more resources to support the principals to make those decisions. And if vouchers gave us that opportunity, there might be some, um, some positive things there. But we've just got reservations about, we haven't seen them a model that would support the kind of collegiality, the kind of system approach to meeting <coughs> needs of schools and students um, wherever they are. Yes, um, my name is Simon Gell. Um, I'm the parent of a boy at a non government school. Um, I must say, having gone through direct changes to the health system, I feel like that's what the city does. Um, we've seen with the health insurance um, system. People who are in Africa earning more than $160,000 a year are really deemed now by the current government to be wealthy. Um, what, in terms of um, the funding of government schools, what's the panel's view about um, whether rich, so called, I don't think there's a system of identifying uh, which are rich government schools and which are not, uh, non rich. But it seems to me that if you're a government school and you get what you get and no regards back to the sort of community in the government schools. In Victoria, uh, we have marvellous uh, government schools like uh, Baldwin High, Campbell High, and a whole range of other schools where there's really a 
scan feed for your intake skill. And similarly with the selective skill, like uh, Melbourne Heart and uh, the Rock and Roberts and Girls Heart, where I don't know what the fees are for all these schools. On, on that model up there, a fee school can get about 887. A fee school for a technical can get about 887. I went on to Melbourne High School, so I think the fee there is about $2,000. What's the panel's view about making so-called wealthy people in, in the government sector, making them pay a fair whack as well? well? Well, you correctly identified that we do have some very good selective schools. In the seat of Higgins, for instance, I do not have any government secondary school other than Melbourne High, which is a selective school, which people need to compete to get into that school. So the options for parents within the electric year are effectively independent schools, which is why I'm such a passionate advocate for this particular issue. Um, on the point that you raise, there is nothing at the moment that would say to somebody who can afford to send their child to an independent school but chooses to send them to a government school. There is no pricing for, for that particular individual at the moment. For somebody who chooses to for instance, upgrade their car, have a nice holiday overseas and send their child to a government school. That, though, is their choice to be able to do that. The concern that we have is that you shouldn't be penalised for sending your child to an independent school if that is your choice. Um, I think so much of the debate that has happened around this issue has been do we support government schools or do we support independent schools? You know, I, I, I can't think of any person on this panel who would say, you know, we don't want to see good support for government schools. What we're simply arguing is that there should not be a penalty imposed on parents who want to make the choice to send their children to an independent school, which is what our great fear is at the moment. But in terms of the government, if you may wish to, to comment, Michelle. Yeah, I've spent quite a bit of time working with in private health, and I know exactly what you mean when you talk about what, what's happened with private health insurance and the private health insurance rebate. When the private health insurance, health insurance rebate was put in um, by the Howard government, the rebate was really to recognise the amount of money that individuals were tipping into the system. It was not attached to anybody's income because it was a recognition that those people were paying more and they were taking pressure off of the government health system. Now it's been changed by a government which says, actually, if you're rich, you can afford to pay. Then we have the government education system, and yes, we all want good government schools, but how do I feel if I'm a parent in Baldwin, living next door to somebody, who, I, I send my child to a non-government school and I might be paying $8,000, $10,000 a year in fees, post-tax income, and I get a small amount of money from government. The person next door sends their child to Baldwin High, takes a holiday to France every year with the family on the money that I might spend for school fees. Um, I don't get a tax break for my money and they don't get a tax break for theirs, but they actually spend their money overseas, so there's not even any GST that comes back. You know. um, so how do I feel about it? Well, I think that's okay, it's my choice. So I send my child to a non-government school, it's my choice. That's fine for now. But if this model comes in and suddenly I have to say, hold on a minute, I'm being penalised for being rich and penalised for my choice and penalised for taking some of the burden off the public sector. That's when I start to get nervous. And I don't see how people can't see this in Australia. I, I think that we're, we're going from one end to another of, of, of encroachment on people's <coughs> rights and on people's, um, on people's sort of incomes. Why is it? It's also false consciousness around who is rich. I mean, who, who sort of determines that in, in that sense? Because there are a lot of people, and I think uh, I think there are a lot of people who send their children to independent schools who actually make very serious sacrifices in order to do that. I mean, Christopher mentioned before we were at, at a uh, Greek Orthodox school before coming here this evening, and we heard from a number of parents who said, if you increase the fees by even a very small margin, we will not be able to afford to send our children to this school. And we will drop out of this school, drop out 
of the independent school sector, which will, again, as Michelle has rightly identified, put additional burdens on the public school sector. And I don't think that helps anybody at all, so I think you're, you're right to be concerned about it. Now, I am very conscious of the time because we did say we would finish at 7 o'clock tonight, but I, I would say there are people who would like to ask other questions or seek further information. Uh, Tanya Coleman, who has done such an amazing job in organising the forum tonight, with great assistance from Lachlan, both of whom work for me, um, with great assistance as well from Pauline, who works for Stephen. Uh, there are some sheets there. If you would like to get in contact, we will make sure that your question gets directed to any member of the panel here and we will respond as quickly as possible. Um, from a personal sense, I'd like to very much again thank you, Stephen, for hosting us here at St Kevin's tonight and to all our panel speakers, you know, Christopher, Michelle and Ross for their very insightful comments. And uh, I'd like to invite Scott Ryan to make a, a formal presentation. So to Scott Ryan. Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, um, everyone, for coming along. I, Kelly asked me to come along to St Kevin's today as an old boy at the school. Um, I can honestly say I am where I am today because I was at this school. I'll let you judge whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> uh, this is a fantastic school. Um, this centre wasn't here. There were only two buildings here when I was here 20 years ago. And one of my close friends from school was on the board. He said to me he knew we were all getting a bit older when one of us had joined the school board. But um, firstly, I want to thank Kelly for organising tonight. Um, Kelly is uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends, but she is a passionate advocate um, for the people of Higgins. And there is really no more important issue to many of us, and I'm a first-time father a few months ago, um, than that of educating our children. And I can honestly say there are few more forceful people about the uh, value of education, the choice in education, and the sacrifices that people made, including Kelly's parents, who I know, to give her that choice, and ensuring that future Australians have the same choice. So, Kelly, congratulations on organising this evening. I'd also like to quickly acknowledge Inga because the State Government, Victoria, Inga and Martin Dixon as the Minister have been very forceful of Gonski, in fact some of the most forceful in any states around the country and I think that's very important because as Kelly and Christopher and Michelle and Ross have pointed out, um, no one level of government can fix this but sadly one level of government probably could screw it up and it's very important to have um, the State Governments who run so many schools and their voice represented. Um, it's my duty to formally thank the participants. So to Pauline, if you could come down, I've got a small presentation for you. Um, the people that make these schools work are important. My mum's a principal in Moody Ponds, and I know how important the staff who make things work are. So Pauline, on behalf of Kelly and the team, thank you very, very much. Um, and look, just briefly, because I know people do need to go, I think we've seen from Ross and Michelle tonight, um, in Canberra and around the country, the voice of independent schools Victoria and the Victorian Catholic Education Office are regarded as the most informed, the most potent, um, the most well-researched. And I think from Ross and from Michelle, we have seen exactly why tonight. Um, we hear more from them in Canberra and people around the country value their input uh, more than just about anyone else because they have so much to say. And as you saw tonight, it's actually based on pretty extensive research. It's incredibly valued to us, valuable to us as members of Parliament uh, because wading through the Gonski Review, while it was Christopher's particular pleasure as the Shadow Minister for Education, is not something all of us have the same amount of time to do. And so to Ross and Michelle, thank you very much. Um, I have some Hague's chocolates for these guests, but I'll, I'll pass them out and I'll walk back. Um, to my colleague, Christopher. Um, Christopher, you will see on TV occasionally, just occasionally. Christopher has an enormous work workload. I mean, education is one of the largest portfolios at the federal level. Uh, but he's also a manager of opposition business in the House of Representatives, which is probably in some ways more fun, but also a little bit more messy a job. Um, Christopher is, you know, he outlined then the, the importance of policies like having um, choice for parents of children with disabilities. Uh, he's a passionate voice for choice, I've described him as before. Um, and I think when he outlined some of those issues like principal autonomy, uh, teacher training, 
and governance issues. We saw that, in essence, one of the things I've said is, if I said to you or I said to my mum, here's $14 billion to spend on education once in a generation, you probably wouldn't have done it building school halls at overpriced costs. So, Christopher, thank you for joining Kelly in this busy schedule. Um, and finally, to Stephen, thank you very much. It is very kind of you to open your facilities to the community and to Kelly and this forum. Uh, you're a critical part of this community, um, and you're, St Kevin's is a school that's flag flies particularly highly. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much.